we're going to continue with two presentations by two speakers you know, Professor Mark Oriacom, Professor of Psychiatry and Addictology in Bordeaux. He doesn't need to be introduced. And Mark will talk to us about craving, what, why is it so important and what to do with it. Then he's going to give the floor to Professor Ikro Marimani, whom you also know. Jean-Pierre in, introduced him yesterday. He's a friend of friends, friend of our symposium, and he uh, often uh, is our host in Italy very often. And he's going to tell us about the spectrum of post-traumatic stress from heroin use. Mark, you have the floor, and, and questions will come later. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, ATHS, for this opportunity. And thank, I would like to thank all of you for being here. In this session, I will tell you about, uh, talk to you about craving. Why is it so important? And shouldn't we go beyond what we are currently doing? I'm working at the University of Bordeaux. I um, manage a research laboratory, uh, working in, uh, among other topics on craving. And I work also in the adaptology poll of the several uh, institutions in the Bordeaux area. And the hospital group of the Gironde department. In a, a research approach, the basis is to listen, to collect information, to hear, in the meaning of understanding, interpreting, and then finally proposing, proposing new, new theories, new explanations to understand the world around us and addiction in our case. Traditionally, this approach is done with a pencil. You take notes, and from your notes, you, in, you interpret these notes and you you process the data. There is an ongoing revolution under our eyes. It's digital, digitization and e-health, where we have the possibility of listening and hearing and proposing with digital tools which enable us to access information in a natural situation. So this enables us to make progress, especially for experience, experiential information. But these digital tools, they have another aspect, which is already here. They can they increase the autonomy of the people concerned. And in the end, we can imagine that the person, thanks to this information, can can better hear himself or herself and better um, make better proposals. In chronic uh, disorders, the challenge for the person is to go from an inv invasory uh, uh, disease to uh, to care, to clarify. The objective is to clarify, distinguish, specify, and personalize, to distinguish addiction from other types of behavior, identify the driving force behind the addiction, and, uh, and personalize to act. Distinguish, sometimes we forget to make the distinction. And this was, uh, we mentioned that yesterday, and when we talked about the e-cigarette, there is a toxicological aspect. So all the addiction objects are toxic, and this has consequences, and it requires a special management. There is a self-therapy aspect, managing emotions, psychiatric disorders. 
all uh, addiction objects have this capacity in some situations to to bring relief which he called the negative reinforcement and the third perspective it uh, came out uh, 10 15 years ago is the addictology aspect which is the deregulation of a reward system of a pleasure system so it's a positive reinforcement uh, we we used to to tend to to mix uh, relief and uh, pleasure but pleasure is not necessarily relief if uh, if uh, you know, it's not always the case so to specify in addiction if we look at the diagnostic criteria we have two limits currently to it's a, a posteriori uh, remark normally we it has to be for 12 months we can say that the disorder is there in a stable manner so we're always behind in terms of diagnosis you since you've had these problems for 12 months i can tell you that you've been sick you've been uh, a patient for 12 months but we didn't know that before so there's a room for improvement and also the diagnosis criteria yes, five. is it a criteria among others in the current list you can have any two criteria among the 11 criteria over 12 months to have the addiction to have a the use disorder but is isn't is it really uh, the same criteria as others since the revision studies looked at the validity of the different diagnosis criteria including craving for the diagnosis when we do that the traditional method the irt the irt method on items uh, response items it's a mathematical uh, method i won't give you the details but there is a collaboration between my laboratory and the Columbia team, an expert in this area in New York, we were able to re-examine the diagnosis criteria. And when we compare the different criteria and in a, in across the different addictions, craving is the most specific and the most discriminating compared to the other criteria. So this is true for substance uh, addiction and this uh, we now uh, there's a study showed that it applies to a potential uh, food addiction besides that craving has a specific place in the diagnosis criteria there's another approach is network analysis by mr baguet with christophe gold in lyon they apply the theory of networks by considering each diagnosis criteria as an independent entity and looking at how they interact with the other criteria. And by they look at the isolated criteria versus the central ones through which the other criteria interact. And again, by comparing through across different addictions, they could show that craving is the most central element, the hub through which the other criteria go through. So this made it possible to validate the fact that we have more central criteria that they are the driving force and in craving and other, other criteria are consequences of the loss of control. Next to the validity, the validation of craving to help the diagnosis, to make sure that someone has the disorder or not, there is the question, and many, many ask the questions, 
is craving just a category, a feature that you have or not? Or is it a variable state? Is it something that varies in intensity and frequency? For a long time, there was a debate about whether among the clinicians, the researchers, their families, if the craving is a driving force in the relapse or is because you consume that you have craving. And for a long time, it was difficult to study the dynamics of craving because it's basically an experiential element, something subjective. And a problem to study subjective uh, phenomena is how you capture it. Normally, you ask you ask questions. Last year, did you experience craving? Uh, yesterday, last month, did you experience anxiety? And this requires, this introduces a bias of the phenomena you want to study, the experience by the individual, but also the mechanics to be able to remember which is an, another quality, and whether he or she remembers to report, to have the words to explain what was felt, which is not easy. The other element is that craving is a, is a fluctuating. So it's difficult to, to pinpoint a fluctuating phenomena. It's there or it's no longer there. And we're talking about an unpleasant experience. So naturally, when you do something and when you have an enable experience, when the when it's no longer there, as a protective measure, you don't think about it anymore, which delays the capacity to learn from this experience. There was there was a. Um, some progress in research with a technological progress. And here I want to mention the contribution by Joan Vincent, a Californian researcher. He, he came to France, he worked in Grenoble. Then, then he was recruited in Bordeaux as a professor. And he, he, brought, he brought a method to study in daily life subjective experiences by using he did not invent the method, but he, he brought it to France by using a smartphone, a smartphone equivalent, and to ask on a daily basis people about their ex what they experience now, rather than asking last week, uh, last month, uh, did you have, uh, did you feel pain, anxiety, depression? No, it's now currently. How do you feel? Are you anxious, depressed, or relaxed? And it's very difficult to remember the way you were yesterday. But if you ask me now how I feel, it's easy to report. Mrs. Thayer adapted this method to the study of craving. And with Mia Fatias, they, they set up a study which showed that there was an association between craving and use. Cra the craving determines the use. This, this was very important. They showed that for different substances. Since then, it was reproduced by many teams in, in Europe and in North America for all substances and for several addictions without substances. What's we should remember that it's a dynamic phenomenon. It's a kinetics of craving. If now, if I have now five over ten, it doesn't have the same predictive value. If I have five out of ten, when this morning I had three, so my craving is increasing. So it increases the 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 probability that I will use this afternoon. But if I went from eight to five, so it's so it's going down. So I'm protected for this uh, from the use for this afternoon. You see how we can anticipate therapeutic system where the individual has access to information. He can adjust his or her care to the needs, and it's not a precaution care as we did in cancer before or by pre precaution 
you you cut the, the maximum and say if i get rid of everything maybe i get rid of the cancer cells where you can the other elements they showed everybody knows about the cues the environment the fact that you meet people who consume the substance you want to control tobacco smell for the the sight of alcohol uh, uh, alcohol uh, advertising this uh, this cues uh, induce uh, the use and they showed that there are individual cues that are there are emotions they can be related to the develop, developmental history of the individual and it has a value of location of craving more powerful than usual cues we are used in post cure uh, we try to avoid these cues, but we forgot about the individual cues that you have inside each individual without being aware of it. Another element is that craving is a, an unpleasant experience, and as such, it generates a response with anxiety and depression. Today, we are in a, comp in a society where the notion of expression and anxiety and depression is shared by everybody. If someone tells tells you in the bus that is anxious or depressed, I understand what he's saying. If he says, I, I feel craving, I say, what is he talking about? So it's, this is a challenge for dual pathologies to make the difference between uh, comorbidity and, uh, and a consequences of a craving that is not well identified. And Fischer and others developed a model called uh, Q craving uh, relapse. In the case of addiction, if we look at all the data that were documented in the, the literature, it shows that all the explanations we gave to explain the relapse seem to be mediated by the cra by craving. This opens a uh, perspective of customization and uh, modification of the care. Finally, there are no other prerequisites than the diagnosis, since we have to be sure that there is a durability, but once you know that it's there, it's access to care as soon as possible. You don't need to talk about the objectives, abstinence, uh, use reduction or evaluate the motivation you have to agree with the individual that then a, you need a clear objective to act on the relapse not by saying na naively just not by saying no more relapse but less with less relapses but with less frequency and you want to add you want to act on an explicit target which is the craving you want to manage craving and abstinence is no longer necessary or sufficient to determine that you have a good result. If someone is abstinent but still feel craving, it means that he's going to use again, is either use the original substance or another one. And all the clinicians know that to go from heroin addiction to alcohol addiction is okay for social relations, but for your health, for physical and mental health, it's not, it's not any better. To, to go from tobacco to from tobacco disorder to food disorder is okay for your lungs, but for your health in general and mental health or longevity, it's not good. So abstinence and reduction is used are the consequences of the care, but there are limits and things that we don't know. And that may contribute to the fact that we don't focus enough on craving we don't take, take into account enough its etiological aspect. If it's predictive, it means that it's etiologic. There are two things that are important 
all the studies showing the evidence of craving is shown in people with many criteria. They have an addiction uh, that has been in place for many years. In that context, craving has a major role. But the question is still open. Is craving the first manifestation of addiction? And at the same time, what is the value of craving when it's isolated? If it's the first manifestation, when someone experiments craving for the first time, is it the beginning of the end or is it just a phenomenon, an independent phenomenon? Another question, one of the one of the limits to identify craving, it requires an explicit attention from the individual. The individual must focus to monitor, to think about its craving, at a, and the craving experience is unpleasant. So it's not something you can uh, you can uh, experience for for a long time. So can the can that identification become automatic? There is a workshop uh, Thursday uh, with the. Uh, the work of Emmanuel Bayer. He did, he made a, a study. Uh, we have the first results now. The, he followed consumers who were not being treated for addiction and who did not consider on, uh, on screening tools, they were not supposed to be addicted. So they were followed for several months to document the emergence of the craving and now how other criteria are associated. And she showed that over a 12 month period, people who never have craving of very few other criteria and very little consumption and people who report craving have, have more other criteria and more consumption. And this is true for alcohol and tobacco. And then we have current studies for other addictions. So we find that either the individual have no craving, but if they have craving, uh, isolated craving doesn't last long. It, very quickly, it's associated with other manifestations. So it's an argument to say that it's a, a preliminary phenomenon. The other element is to able to relieve the individual from the permanent effort to monitor the craving with an automatic system. This is something that many teams are looking for, but it's difficult because there are many operational questions that will be dealt with in the Thursday workshop. But by use by using the by collecting the experience and monitoring with connected objects with physiological measures, Emmanuel Bayet and his colleagues were able to identify a system which makes it possible to determine which who, which individual is experimenting, experiencing craving. So we can say, then for, you can alert your doctor, or even better, in a perspective of empowerment, alert the individual to enable him or her to take action quickly. In conclusion, Uh, addictology uh, in 2030, 2040, we have many criteria where we have the loss of control and its consequences. Maybe we should do this last step. And even if we are all concerned with consumption and their consequences, maybe we should uh, forget about the use, which is only a consequence of addiction, by making sure that the individual has an operational knowledge of the use. If someone must consume uh, in a smoking, by smoking, it's better to, to vape than, um, than to smoke. If you have uh, IV injections, so you have to do it right. If you consume alcohol and drive, you should know that you should drive after drive, you should drink after driving and not before. And once the individual knows the rules, don't focus on the uses to focus on craving. 
and what implies some work with a person to be able to identify and trans transmit that information that's where uh, the digital tools are involved where you can it anticipate uh, thera therapeutic actions i thank you before i give the floor to ecomani to to introduce the team that worked uh, with me and the workshops. Don't forget to go to the ATHS uh, uh, workshops. The plenary sessions are great, but the workshops are uh, the future. That's where we have exchanges. And this afternoon, there is a workshop where we're going to combine the, the medical approach and the administrative and regulatory approach to you know, how to better manage the centers uh, for addicted individuals. Thank you, Mark. And so without further ado, we're going to uh, listen to uh, um, Dr. Marimani on um, PTSD. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, thanks uh, for coming to this uh, symposium uh, that is dedicated to a new point of view of post-traumatic stress disorder. Today, I want to talk to you about a particular type of PTSD, an invention of my research group, useful in monitoring patients during an opioid agonist treatment. This is my conflict of interest statement. Why a post-traumatic spectrum in heroin addicts? Because uh, it's our dominant idea that uh, we must move towards a patient's tailored therapy, even in drug addiction. We no longer must base our clinical judgment on whether the patient uses the substance or not. We must also evaluate other aspects of which the post-traumatic spectrum is, in my opinion, important. So I will start with the essential features of clinical experience, namely vulnerability factors and stress sensitivity, and then uh, I will mention the relationship between uh, PTSD and addiction. Next, I will discuss how to assess the post-traumatic spectrum in heroin addicts. Finally, in the last part of my presentation, I will show you the impact of stress sensitivity during treatment. So, turning to the vulnerability factor in addiction. Here is a brief overview of the recent literature. Repeated exposure to a rewarding substance is an essential element for the development of addiction. Still, its overclinical manifestations are highly dependent on interaction, on interacting with biological, environmental and psychosocial factor. In particular, what we want to address in this presentation is the role of strength stress response regulation. The role of stress in addiction has been studied for decades. Many leading addiction theories converge in recognize stress as a key factor in increasing vulnerability to addiction. This uh, is a schematic model of the perpetuation of such process. On the one hand, there is a reverberant circuit that involves genetic and environmental vulnerability factors. 
this leads to chronic distress and to a maladaptive response selection with new adaptations in stress and reward circuits in the brain. On the other hand, this circuit intervenes in the experimental drug use, in the frequency of a drug use, and in the regulation, in the regular and chronic drug use pattern. Stress is therefore a key factor in the development and the impairment of a drug addiction. But uh, how do we cl clinically recognize stress in substance use disorder patients? We want to focus on stress sensitivity, namely the ability to process life events and manage emotional reactions. First, several studies have shown the impact of repeated stressful or traumatic events at an early age in developing substance use behavior. The biological correlates of the stress response have been explored. In particular, the dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis has shown a closer association with addiction and many other stress-related psychiatric disorders, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. In particular, our research group, in collaboration with an Holland research group, suggested the using the air cortisol level to assess long-term HPA axis activity. It has been observed that the activity of the HPA axis is not only more dysregulated in dual disorder patients, but also that it increases in relation to the severity of the addiction itself in dual disorder patients. Among stress-related psychiatric disorder, as I mentioned, PTSD plays a central role in relation to substance use disorder, not only because of the high prevalence of PTSD substance use disorder comorbidity, but also because the coexistence of the two disorders displays a more severe clinical features which are less responsive to treatment. This motivates the need for a more extensive assessment of stress sensitivity in clinical practice and, in particular, of clinical features suggestive of PTSD. Much research has led to the Sametio pathogenetic hypothesis trying to explain the close relationship between substance use disorder and PTSD. As already mentioned, much of this work has focused on the influence of a chronic stress and trauma exposure in the likelihood of an individual developing a substance use disorder. Specifically, some psychological research consider substance use behavior as a coping strategy for dealing with the stress in order to dampen inner tension and self-medicating and reducing withdrawal related distress. This is consistent with the Kantian hypothesis the self-medication hypothesis. On the other hand, stress theories of addiction based on neurobiological model have been proposed in which <clears throat> stress stressful life events induced brain modification may predispose both to PTSD and substance use disorder. However, a few observations have led to the hypothesis of a common background involving the opioid system 
which could represent a shared community vulnerability condition underlying both post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use disorder. This follows from the observation that opioid agonist medication are able to limit the onset of PTSD after traumatic war events. And the patients suffering from severe pain treated with opioids showed a reduced rate of PTSD symptoms. This leads to the idea the opioid may act as a barrier to the, to the development of PTSD. What if this regulation of the opioid system is involved in stress-related disorders? What are the consequences of an opioid system impairment? May PTSD be a consequence of such unbalanced brain systems. Moreover, we know that a substance using lifestyle may predispose a substance user to experience stressful or traumatic events. Furthermore, we also know that substance users become more sensitive to stress the longer the history of addiction. Together with the observation that the stress sensitivity appears to be a key cross-sectional element in the onset and progression of a substance use disorder, a new hypothesis has been proposed. May substance use disorder be an independent risk factor in increasing individual susceptibility to PTSD? So, if it is true, therefore, that the development of addiction seems to be influenced by life events and traumas, it is also worth speculating that, almost symmetrically, an imbalance in the stress-regulating brain system also seems capable of influencing reactions to life events. What could be the long-term consequences of an unbalanced opioid brain system? Is it possible that addiction may influence the onset and development of stressful life events? Here, you can see what we use to assess the post-traumatic spectrum in psychiatric patients. We evaluate the emotional reaction of our passion after, even after events that uh, do not endanger our passion life. However, we evaluate this emotional response to trauma and loss through the behaviors used to diagnose PTSD. With this concern, over the last decades, the PISA School of Addiction Medicine has uh, extensively explored the relationship between substance use disorder and PTSD in heroin use disorder patients. Specifically, it was argued that the onset of substance use may be preceded by the development of a stress-related disorder in the clinical history, possibly contributing to increase the individual susceptibility to them. And this is the classical view. The first question is, are there any difference in stress sensitivity before and after the age at onset of dependence, heroin dependence. Namely, considering the age at which substance use disorder patients passed from occasional to continuous use of the rewarding substances. Although the post-dependence period was shorter than the pre-dependence period, 
an increase in stress of life events during the post-dependence periods was observed. The second question was, uh, is there a variation in the emotional responses to, to stressful life events on the continuative use of the substance of Kurtz? Even more interesting, is this a second finding? The severity of the reaction to life events was higher after the age at onset of dependence. So, an overreaction to life events was found in substance use disorder patients. That is, a reduced ability to manage the emotional response to life events seems to be exhibited during the course of the addiction process. Even more interesting is the observation that this post-traumatic emotional reaction is directly proportional to the severity of heroin addiction. Or at least, the post-traumatic spectrum is more serious in patients in phase three, in patients with the previous therapeutic fillers, and the polyabuser patients. No difference is observed whether the patient uses heroin daily or not. Another interesting observation is that the subject stabilized at higher doses of methadone show a lower severity of symptoms. Is it possible that the PTSD patients also show a post-traumatic spectrum? And uh, what is the cutoff uh, of the spectrum that uh, distinguishes patients who have uh, and do not have uh, PTSD after uh, catastrophic events? Using the archive of the post-traumatic spectrum of uh, young survivors of the 2009 earthquake in L'Aquila, Italy, we highlighted the value of uh, 32. This cutoff, 32, of the spectrum can differentiate those who have developed the classic PTSD from those who have not developed it. And this allow us to say that heroin addicts for a long time, even if not exposed to a catastrophic events, can develop a post-traumatic spectrum like earthquake survivors who have developed PTSD. Also, the severity of this post-traumatic spectrum in heroin use disorder patients with the survivors with the PTSD is very similar and significantly more severe than that of a survivor who did not develop PTSD. In conclusion, Erony addicts can develop a post-traumatic spectrum in frequency and severity, no different from PTSD-affected survivors after a catastrophic events, but without ever being exposed to it. However, we can note that the post-traumatic spectrum of erony addicts show, at least on discriminant function two, some difference from survivors who developed PTSD. At this point, I have to introduce the heroin PTSD spectrum inventory. This inventory is a 30 item derived for the trauma and loss spectrum self-report instrument. Such an instrument showed adequate test retest rate, internal consistency, and a cutoff of 12. Thus, allowing the study of stress sensitivity in heroin use disorder patients through the PTSD spectrum. The PISA School of Addiction Medicine has already shown that the substance users have their own specificity in terms of psychopathology. That is, the SEL9 the original dimension are not able to specifically represent substance use disorder patients. 
and uh, a five factor psychopathological dimension structure has been found, which is uh, specific for these uh, patients. Similarly, can we say the same for uh, the spectrum, for heroin post-traumatic spectrum? That, that is, uh, it's true that uh, substance use disorder patients exhibit different ways of reacting to stress than other psychiatric patients. We tried to factorize the reduced scale through a class latent analysis, but there are no latent classes in our card. Or rather, there are two classes, but the first is related to the absence of spectrum behaviors, and the second is related to the presence. This allow us to highlight the specificity of the heroin post-traumatic spectrum characterized by the presence or absence of a certain behavior, specific behavior. These are the symptoms more present in heroin addicts. They belong to maladaptive coping, but are a mixture of the factors highlighted in psychiatric patients. And the note that the grief reaction symptoms are less important. There are the rare symptoms in drug addicts. The heroin spectrum chart was recently administered on a sample of heroin use disorder patients undergoing opioid agonist treatment in the attempt to explore the relationship between stress sensitivity and heroin addiction related clinical feature. We specifically checked the correlation between stress sensitivity and the extent of the heroin use disorder clinical feature. And then we compared the patients with and without problematic stress sensitivity. That is with and without heroin post-traumatic spectrum. We use this kind of assessment. Here are the results of the study. First, correlation between the spectrum of post-traumatic stress disorder and characteristic of opioid use disorder. As you can see, a closer relationship was first found between stress sensitivity and economic conditions. What is also interesting in the significant correlation with the domain of altered mental status at the treatment entry, concomitant use of other rewarding substances, and the history of a previous repeated treatment. This correlation demonstrates a close relation between the PTSD spectrum and some of the main feature of the drug addiction history. Equally interesting is the find of a close association between stress sensitivity and the indices of substance use disorder specific psychopathology demonstrated by high significant correlations on all of the psychopathological items. Finally, the higher the spectrum, the worse, of course, were the levels of subjective well-being reported by the patients. Turning to comparison, the group of patients with the PTSD spectrum was made up of a higher number of female subjects with the lower economic conditions. In addiction, the two groups differed in terms of altered mental status at the treatment entry, work adjustment, and legal problem, aspect in which heroin PTSD spectrum patients had a significantly high, higher impairment rates. In addiction, in terms of psychopathology, subjective well-being and addictive behavior, patients with heroin post-traumatic spectrum were characterized by a greater severity of a psychopathology and a reduced level of subjective well-being. In conclusion, high level of self-reported stress sensitivity 
were correlated with the alter in the mental status at the treatment entry, substance for use, lifetime different treatments load, severity of a psychopathological syndrome, and subjective well wellness. Heroin use disorder patients with the heroin post-traumatic spectrum were females with a low income. Their addiction history was characterized by more severe mental status at the treatment entry, more impairment in working adaptation, and a higher rate of legal problems during the treatment. Also, they showed higher level of psychopathology and less subjective wellness. Are there any clinical implications? We think so. In fact, even through substance use disorder is a chronic disorder, treatment is generally time limited. This is an absurdity. However, in clinical practice, there are no biological or clinical standards for deciding the treatment stop. In this context, the study of a patient's specific psychopathology, addictive behavior, and stress sensitivity seems to be able to provide the new clinical information for clinical monitoring for our patients during treatment. It could represent the key to a definitive shift from a treatment merely addressing harm reduction towards the development of a personalized treatment strategies tailored to the patients. We recommend that uh, an opioid agonist treatment should not stop it until this uh, craving-related behavior, psychopathological symptom, and uh, especially stress sensitivity are extinguished. Otherwise, we would not be treating patients. We would still be doing a harm reduction. Harm reduction is good, but uh, we want to do much more. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ikro, merci. Nous avons quelques minutes pour répondre aux questions des deux de, 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 de Thank you, Ikro, thank you very much. We have some minutes for questions to summarize craving with Mark and this experimental models and also comorbidity, and um, which is uh, also related to post-traumatic stress and uh, heroin use disorder. So, well, of course, with ICRO, this is a subject that uh, they master. So, do you have questions or remarks? Or would you like some clarification? We've got a few minutes, and uh, you shall introduce yourselves. Katia Lel, I'm a doctor in Paris. Thank you for your presentation, and thank you for correlating PTSD and addiction. I have two questions. First of all, I'm interested in the screening of diazepine uh, which could be interesting for managing craving. We know that diazepine is uh, efficacious in PTSD. So is the efficacy on craving uh, is also related to the one at PTSD or directly only to craving? And second question, and this is rather a remark. Given the vulnerability to develop trends to opioids for people who suffer from PTSD, wouldn't it be interesting to think about antalgic and opioid treatments? Since we know of this vulnerability of, uh, for people um, suffering from PTSD,
Tu peux peut-être commencer à répondre sur la partie craving, Emma. Well, I'm going to to give an answer regarding craving. Yes, but if we want to answer the craving side, we have to deal with PTSD. I do not understand French, and you speak too fast for me. Miltazapine sedative, anti-anxiety, and so it's good, especially when there is an hypophoric form. And the hypophoric form is the part of the outcome of the substance use disorder in general. And in my opinion, an agonist of opioid system, but also an agonist of noradrenergic, dopaminergic, and serotonergic agent can be useful also in post-traumatic, aero in post-traumatic stress disorder, especially mirtazapine at the end of an agonist opioid treatment. Rapidement sur... And very quickly, relating this to craving, well, this is quite a challenge. It's a fundamental challenge. And this is a challenge in terms of the phenomenon itself and also a semiologic challenge because there is so much data that shows that a previous experience of stress is a risk factor of vulnerability for all kinds of addictions and mental disorders. So PTSD is obviously a disorder in itself and there's stress, of course. So there's this vulnerability to develop further on other addictions or other uh, psychiatric disorders. So now, what is responsible for what? Well, we still have to think about this. But anyway, this challenge in terms of the cost of consuming and also the induced effect of intoxication and then craving and then abstinence and then other substances that can lead to depressive manifestations. So actually, we need to research more on this vulnerability we, uh, related to stress or related to contemporary a disorder. And in the case of an addiction and in the case of a non-verbalized craving, the consequence is to experience anxiety and despair. So, well, this is actually the challenge with dual pathologies. It's this kind of magma and it's this kind of sluggish uh, ground and uh, yeah, in which we are trapped. Yes, indeed. And actually, since you were mentioning this, we were talking about this notion of comorbidity of dual pathology. There's uh, an effect regarding this, well, the management of this. I mean, any family could administer uh, antidepressants, but there's also the effect of prescribing that. And there's an effect in the pathology and in the symptoms associated to craving. And there's an improvement of this associated cre symptoms to craving. And there's less pressure on craving. So is this less specific? Well, I don't think so. But with, uh, with the limited therapeutic um, options, we can only encourage this kind of prescription, especially when these symptoms require it. All right. Pierre-Manuel Rosier. This is just one remark. I would like to thank ATHS and I would like to thank them for having this video conferences now and the streaming now because, well, it really allows us to follow the conference everywhere. I am responsible for a hospital which opened four years ago and we're really working very hard on craving, psychoeducation related to craving. And we've, there's a semiologic issue. What is the difference between craving and dissociation? Because when patients report their subjective experience of craving between the point A, I feel like 
using drugs and then I have used drugs, you know, there's um, the experience of craving like a dissociation element. With naltrexone, we can diminish this with for alcohol, for example. But it's true that very often we find this association between adverse events and the intensity of addiction. So I would like to know if you take into account this dissociation effect when you talk about craving. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It's actually a real issue and I do not have an answer because if we're just at the descriptive level, yes, indeed, there's a dissociation between the fact of feeling eager to do something, but this this eagerness is not considered as something adequate. So this is something that I can appreciate. But I cannot say, I'm not able to say, I want to get rid of this eagerness to use. And then we're used to reserving the word dissociation to certain pathologies. So, of course, yeah, we're a little bit trapped because dissociation is traditionally reserved to another context and it loses its value in this descriptive context. And it would be a mistake to say, and this was the case actually some time ago, it's a mistake to say that addiction is a kind of psychotic disorder because disorder, um, dissociation is a psychotic process. And actually, when patients experience craving, yes, they use terms, they use a terminology to define this craving. I mean, the, the, the way they present this is, is, is the definition of craving is actually something that pushes you to do something. It pushes you. So, of course, there's this state that has been described by Mark, and Mark measured this in his studies. We could also say from an operational point of view that if we think about neuroleptics and antipsychotic um, medication, there is an effect of aggravation of addictions, except for clozapine. So this is also an element to, that makes us think that, well, we're not talking structurally about the same thing. We're just going to deal with one last question. A short question. Thank you about talking about the trauma and the PSTD. Um, I have a question. Are you talking about patients who've had trauma and PSCD from childhood issues when they were younger? Or, and also people who are older who recently experienced trauma, like refugees coming from war torn countries? And are there any cofactors that are very similar that help with your counseling? Because we work with refugees and we help really teach coping skills. And something simple yes, like this. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the normality. Yes, yes. Okay. The normality is uh, the trauma before addiction. But uh, there is another thing to try to, to, to make attention the post addiction. Because uh, also in the post-addiction, patients without uh, trauma in the childhood okay. can have uh, the reaction like post-traumatic stress disorder okay. in the post-addiction. If uh, we have uh, pre and post, it's terrible. And uh, is uh, a key to understand why it's difficult to block the okay. treatment, especially in patients who continue to, add, to have this okay. kind of post-traumatic symptomatology also when they stopped to use the substances yeah. because there is something in, the, in, their, yes. in their own. And it's the trauma that's the trigger. Yes. Why yes. not? Yes. Why not? Treatment, pharmacology, 
psychotherapy, and so on uh, together. Uh, Ikro, can you put your um, just your mask? Well, well, the last question for me. Uh, yes, yes, you can put it. Uh, what me on our right? Ah, yeah, quelqu'un, pardon. Yes. Okay, can Ivan. You, yes. Thank you. If I can make a, a quick comment about the craving, Mark. I mean, uh, I don't know if you received the email that I sent you. We recently the FDA publish some guidelines for clinical trials to approve medications for a stimulant use disorders they do not accept craving as okay. an outcome so they it, the, the possibility of developing a an anti-craving medication is even more remote than ever because if they they basically are saying the construct of craving doesn't exist imagine okay. So we are we are in a, right now we are and we are very concerned about that guidance. In fact, anyone from any part of the world is welcome to provide comments. So I invite people to, if you Google FDA guidance stimulant, you can look at the publication. And I invite people to submit comments because this is terrible for the field. If craving is one of our main outcomes, and if they don't accept it, then we will never be able to develop any treatment for okay. craving. Okay. Um, thank you, Ivan. Just a dernière question. Just one last question. Uh, in your series about uh, PTSD, uh, post-addiction, can we talk about an early um, sexual abuse, for example, because there are clinical effects. So have you found uh, any kind of uh, phenomena like this? Uh, when we studied uh, the post-traumatic spectrum, oui. we try to eliminate uh, all people with uh, good stress in okay. the past, in the childhood, especially sexual abuse, yes. or uh, dangerous for life uh, situations. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the post-traumatic is yes. uh, in people without uh, this kind uh, yes. of a situation in uh, preceding uh, addiction. Thank you very much, Icro. Merci, Marc. Merci oui. à tous. Thank you very much, Icro and Marc. Thank you very much. And please don't move because Mark is going to take the floor for the symposium.